we're going to talk about muscle, um, and we go. We are first going to recap the three types of muscle and how to identify them histologically. Um, so this is repeat from exam one. So you could take out your exam notes, um, and you should be able to just like in exam one, be able to identify smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and skeletal muscle. Uh, you should be able to tell me locations, and you should tell be able to tell me function. So smooth muscle, <clears throat> remember smooth muscle lacks those striations, and they have spindle-shaped fibers. These are uninucleate, so one nucleus per muscle fiber. Um, remember, muscle fiber just means muscle cell. Um, they're living cells, but because they're elongated, uh, people have referred to them as muscle fibers. But spindle-shaped muscle fibers, one nucleus per cell, uh, you find smooth muscle in the walls of hollow organs, uh, blood vessels, uh, urinary bladder, uterus, all throughout the digestive tract and the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine. Um, so anywhere we have hollow organs. And the function is to be able to contract involuntarily. So this is under autonomic control. We do not have... Um, the ability to control this contraction of smooth muscle. So it's involuntary movement. Cardiac muscle, remember cardiac muscle also, or cardiac muscle has striations just like that in, of skeletal muscle, but in cardiac muscle, the muscle fibers are going to be uninucleate, meaning one nucleus per muscle fiber, and you see these darker striations. Remember those more bold, darker striations? Those are intercalated discs. Um, Intercalated discs are specialized gap junctions that allows for really fast conduction of electrical impulses. So cardiac muscle, you find this in the heart, in the walls of the heart, uh, cardiac referring to heart. Um, and those intercalated discs allow for, so your heart, you have two sets of chambers. You have an atria, uh, you have two, um, a right and left atrium, you have a right and left ventricle. And the atria have to contract together really quickly. It has to be super synchronized to push the blood in one direction. And then the ventricles have to contract together very synchronized in order to push the blood in one direction. So in order to ensure synchronized contractions within the, the um, cavities of the heart, we want really fast conduction of that electrical impulse. And so we find those intercalated discs. Okay. And cardiac muscle is much more branched. Um, when we, as skeletal muscle, when we look at that, you don't see branching. So cardiac muscle, you see striations, you see branching, but the dead giveaway is you see these intercalated discs. Um, this is also under involuntary control. Uh, so we don't have to think about our heart contracting and pumping blood. It happens automatically. Skeletal muscle, which the majority of this exam is going to be over skeletal muscles, um, identification and knowing movements of skeletal muscles. Um, this is skeletal muscle on a histology slide. So really long fi muscle fibers, muscle cells, really long muscle fibers. Um, you don't see branching. They're multinucleate. So if you look this is an individual muscle cell, muscle fiber, and there are multiple nuclei pushed to the periphery. And so throughout embryonic development, what happens, multiple cells fuse together so that we can get these really long muscle fibers. The longer the muscle fiber, the greater the force of the contraction, the greater movement we can have. Um, so we see striations, just like we saw in cardiac, but no intercalated discs. These fibers are very parallel, um, no branching, and then multinucleate. Okay? We find skeletal muscle tissue, this is skeletal muscle tissue, in skeletal muscle organs. So skeletal muscle, the organ, these are organs that are attached to um, the, the skeleton, right? And when they contract, they move the skeleton throughout the environment. Okay? So this is skeletal muscle tissue and you find it in skeletal muscle, the organs, okay, uh, which are attached to the skeleton and provide movement of the skeleton. This is under voluntary control. So we decide when we want to talk. So our tongue is made up of skeletal muscle. 
we want to move, walk, or go run, or move our hands. It's all skeletal, skeletal muscle. That's all voluntary control. So there are some connective, because skeletal muscles, the organs, are made up of lots and lots of skeletal muscle fibers, um, there are going to be uh, lots of connective tissue coverings associated with muscles because connective tissue coverings will provide um, attachments to the skeleton, but then connective tissue throughout the, the skeletal muscle organ itself will provide uh, nervous tissue and vascular tissue, all of that. Okay, so um, some of the larger connective tissue coverings, uh, fascia, this is the, remember when you learned the integumentary system and you learned the layers of the skin, epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. In that hypodermis, you have adipose, but you also have that loose areolar connective tissue. The protein, the extracellular protein fibers of that loose areolar connective tissue will attach the dermis and epidermis above to the muscles that lie below. Okay. And that is, and that will, those protein fibers will intermingle with the connective tissue that directly surrounds the skeletal muscle organs, um, and that's called fascia. Okay, so this is the skeletal, this is the connective tissue coverings um, that pretty much anchor the skin to the muscles uh, themselves. Tendons, these are cord-like, uh, so bundles or cords of connective tissue that, that anchor and connect the skeletal muscle organs to the skeleton itself. So tendons connect muscle to bone, okay? And they're cord-like, okay? Aponeurosis, so an aponeurosis is a sheet of connective tissue that covers mus multiple muscles usually. So an aponeurosis similar to a tendon, it helps connect multiple muscles, it helps connect to the, uh, to the skeleton, um, but it's a sheet rather than a cord. So a tendon is like a cord, aponeurosis is a sheet of connective tissue uh, made up of, and all of these are fibrous connective tissue, okay, made up of fibrous connective tissue. You can see two prominent aponeuroses uh, in this image right here. So on the, on the top of the, the cranium, there's a frontalis muscle, and then on the very back, so frontalis because it covers the frontal bone, uh, there's also an occipitalis muscle, which covers the occipital bone. So good thing a lot of these muscles are named for what bones they attach to, where they're found, what regions of the body are they found. Um, so this is where anatomical terminology comes into play and helps you a lot. So there's a prominent aponeurosis that connects that frontalis and that occipitalis muscle together, and it, it anchors them to the cranium uh, itself. There's also another prominent aponeurosis that covers the abdominal, um, abdominal muscles right here. So a sheet of connective tissue, fibrous connective tissue, that connects multiple muscle groups together, allows them to work in unison. Um, all right, so now let's talk about the connective tissue coverings as we go deeper within a skeletal muscle organ. So surrounding the entire muscle, so this is an uh, entire skeletal muscle organ, and surrounding the directly adhered to the outside, this would be called the epimysium. So the epimysium, this, these are all fibrous connective, fiber, fibrous connective tissue investments, and the fibers of that epimysium will be intermingling with the fibers of your hypodermis and that's your fascia, okay? But if it's directly attached to the skeletal or muscle uh, organ itself, it's called epimysium. So epi above, mysium referring to muscle, okay? Now this muscle organ, the skeletal muscle organ is uh, cut in cross section and we are taking out a bundle of skeletal muscle fiber cells. So it's a bundle of skeletal muscle cells and you can look, there are multiple bundles Okay, this bundle is called a fascicle, okay? So this, right here, this term. So this bundle is called a fascicle, and the connective tissue that covers this fascicle is called perimysium, right? Surrounds a fascicle. Now we can take out a, um, an individual skeletal muscle cell, right? This is an individual skeletal muscle cell, 
And the connective tissue surrounding that individual skeletal muscle cell, right, is called endomycium. Endo, like underneath and within. So it's the endomycium covers an individual skeletal muscle cell. And then if we look even further, so what's being pulled out of this individual skeletal muscle cell, these are all myofibrils. Myofibrils are bundles of actin and myosin, and actin and myosin are key players in skeletal muscle contraction, okay? And the arrangements of that actin and myosin give that skeletal muscle that striated appearance on a histology slide. So directly adhered to the outside of a skeletal muscle organ, that connective tissue is epimycium. A skeletal muscle organ is made up of multiple bundles of skeletal muscle cells. That bundle is called a fascicle, and that's surrounded by a connective tissue investment called perimycium. Then an individual skeletal muscle cell is surrounded by a connective tissue investment called endomycium. And then located within that individual cell or all of these myofibrils made up of arrangements of actin and myosin. All right, so why have all these all of these connective tissue investments throughout the muscle, uh, skeletal muscle organ? So embedded in that connective, so remember connective tissue is vascularized, the majority of uh, connective tissues are vascularized, and so these connective tissue investments contain arteries, veins, uh, so vas blood vessels, right, vasculature. Um, it also contains nerves, and we have to have nervous uh, input to the skeletal muscles to get that contraction. So our brain, our, we decide to move our skeletal muscles, but our brain has to communicate that to the skeletal muscles via neurons, okay? So we have to have nervous tissue supply as well. And so we have all of these connective tissue investments so that we can have lots of blood vessels, skeletal muscles use a lot of energy, require a lot of oxygen for cellular respiration, so it needs to be highly vascularized, okay? Um, these connective tissue investments also allow for, uh, like, just in case if there were injury to a portion or a section of a skeletal muscle organ, the the fascicles and the cells that were not injured can act somewhat independently uh, from the, the areas that were damaged, okay? So this is a histology slide just showing you like this is a fascicle, so a bundle of skeletal muscle cells, right? And this is the connective tissue, the perimysium that surrounds a fascicle. And then each one of these is an individual skeletal muscle cell. The nuclei are pushed to the periphery and surrounding an individual skeletal muscle cell would be that endomycium. So this is a sarcomere. So all along these myofibrils, which are the individual skeletal muscle cell is just packed full of myofibrils. And again, those myofibrils are arrangements of actin and myosin, so protein filaments. And along those uh, protein, those myofibrils, this is how actin and myosin are arranged. So this is the anatomy of a sarcomere, okay? And <clears throat> the, these thick filaments right here, these thick filaments are myosin, okay? And you can see the myosin have these globular heads that come off at each end, okay? So these are thick filaments, myosin filaments, and then these very slender ones, these are thin filaments, these are actin, okay? And you'll notice that the actin filaments are anchored, so the thin actin filaments are anchored to these Z-discs or Z-lines, okay? These are just proteins that anchor the actin, okay? And over here, we have these actin filaments anchored to this Z-line. So a sarcomere is defined as, so anytime you hear sarco pertaining to skeletal muscle, um, a, sar a sarcomere is defined from being from Z-line to Z-line. So this is one sarcomere. And then from this Z-line to the next would be another sarcomere. So all along the length of those my myofibrils, down the length of the entire cell, just thousands and thousands and thousands of sarcomeres. Okay, um, you see the myosin filaments, these thick filaments, are anchored to proteins down the midline, and this is called the M-line. Okay. 
Okay. So these myosin filaments are anchored in the midline and the myosin filaments do not move. Okay. What happens now, I'm not going to ask the detailed physiology of muscle contraction. I just want you to understand the overall sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. And that is, if you see right here in the very middle where you just see thick. So this is a relaxed sarcomere. And I know that because I see this H band and I see I bands. So an H band is just thick myosin filaments, okay? So this H band is just thick myosin filaments. Um, I bands right here, okay? So from here to where the myosin starts, this is an I band. And from here to here is an I band. I bands are just thin filaments. And then right here, okay, where you have overlapping thick and thin, this is called the A band. Okay, so if you have overlapping thick and thin filaments, that's called an A band. Now what happens, um, there's a, a, a long list of steps before before this, but again, you just need to know understand the overall big picture concept of the sliding muscle, uh, the sliding filament theory. These globular heads coming up, coming above, coming off the myosin uh, filament above and below, these globular heads attach to the actin filaments above and below. And what happens is they power stroke or they move and they will actually pull so they move this way and these globular heads will pull the actin in towards the H band and then over here these globular heads attach to, to the actin above and below and pull the actin filaments this way. So actin filaments over here get pulled in towards the to the M line. These actin filaments get pulled in towards the M line. And so what happens, these Z lines get pulled in towards the M line. So in a fully contracted sarcomere, it would be essentially all A band. So all overlapping thick and thin filaments. This H band would disappear because as these globular heads move, they're going to slide the actin in towards the M line, the midline of the sarcomere, okay? So in a fully contracted sarcomere, you would have very little H band, if any, and it would almost be all A band, which is overlapping thin and uh, thick and thin filaments. And so the I bands would disappear as well, okay? Because these would be moved in. So that's the sliding filament theory. So this is what happens on in all of the sarcomeres along the length of all of the myofibrils in a muscle cell. And so each sarcomere will shorten, that's going to contract the overall muscle, okay? Because this is happening in all of the myofibrils of all the cells within an entire skeletal muscle organ. Um, so you should be familiar with um, what an origin and insertion is. Now, for all the muscles, I'm not going to ask you to know the origins and insertions for all the muscles. I, the, the, what you are going to have to learn, so I'll post documents of all of the muscles that you need to be able to identify. You will need to be able to, so I'm going to post Word documents. Any muscle that's listed on those Word documents, you need to be able to identify on the models. I have videos of me going through all the models, showing you where the muscles are. You need to know how to identify it on the models. You need to know their movements. If you look in your book under chapter nine, I believe, there's these really nice summarized tables of all, and you can go in and highlight all the muscles because there are way more muscles than what I'm gonna make you learn. But you can go in and highlight the muscles from that table, from those tables. And it's really nice because those tables tell you the muscle name, the origin, the insertion, and the action, and the action means like the movement. Now y'all learned joints last week. Miss Ariel went over, uh, if you're in my 7 p.m. Uh, class, Miss Ariel went over the movements. If you're in my 7 a.m. class, I went over the joint movements. But knowing those joint movements will help you understand these muscle movements, okay? Because when these skeletal muscles contract, they cause the movements at those joints, right? Uh, especially those synovial joints. So you need to be able to identify the muscle uh, and you need to know their action, 
Okay, so what movements they carry out and those tables in the chapter nine of your book is going to be super helpful to kind of focus your learning, okay? Uh, origin and insertion, I want you to look at your origins and insertions because all of those bone parts that I made you learn for exam two, guess what? A lot of those are origins and insertion points for skeletal muscles. And if you understand that the origin is the immovable end, so that where the muscle originates, where it's attached to and it originates from, and then the insertion is the movable end, if you look at those and you look at the action that these muscles carry out, it really helps you understand like, oh yeah, that makes sense that it would carry out that movement based on where it's attached, where its origin is and where its insertion is. So over here, this is an example of the biceps brachii. Uh, biceps, bi means two, Seps refers to like, a if you think like a cephalopod, a cephalopod a cephalic, it's head. So biceps brachii, brachii referring to the brachial region, right? Anatomical terminology, y'all. Um, so biceps means two heads. But if you, so the, it, the origin, the immovable end of the biceps brachii, there are, uh, one of the origins is the coracoid process of the scapula. Imagine that, a, a bone part that you needed to learn, right? So we have the origin at this coracoid process and the insertion at the radial tuberosity, right? And the radius of the radius bone. Again, another part that I made you learn for bones. So this origin, this immovable end, coracoid process up here, down here is the insertion, the movable end at the radial tuberosity, so when this biceps brachii contracts, the insertion is going to move towards the origin. And that's why your biceps brachii carries out flexion of the arm at the elbow. So this guy is flexing, this biceps is contracting and bringing the insertion closer to the origin, okay? Uh, skeletal muscles, um, an agonist. So a lot of skeletal muscles, there'll be multiple muscles that um, multiple muscles that carry out the same movement. An agonist carries out that movement. A whatever movement you're talking about, a synergist would be another muscle that also carries out that movement. And then an antagonist would oppose, uh, would be a muscle that opposes that movement, okay? And I'll go into more detail about uh, agonist, synergist, and antagonist relationships and what I'll ask on the test. But what I want y'all to focus on is looking at those Word documents and uh, highlighting the muscles in your book and starting to learn the actions so that when you come into lab, you can focus on identifying them on the models.